So welcome, we're here on the streets. I'm ready with my microphone and we are on the south bank of the river and we'll just wait a moment or two until we start the tour just to see there are a few people online and I get a good signal. Okay, welcome here everyone to the River Thames for a tour, a walk entitled The World of Ian Fleming, but also it seems that we need to talk about James Bond as well. A lot of work going along the river at the moment. They are doing some work on the sewer system. A lot of it hasn't changed since the 1800s. We're in the area of Vauxhall, in Russian Vauxhall, which actually means amusement park. There used to be a pleasure garden in this area, the Vauxhall Pleasure Garden, and that was here until about 1859. Until the 1880s, this area, which is still central London, was part of the county of Surrey. So London as a county extended in the 1880s, and Surrey as the county got smaller. The building in front of us, of course, is iconic to any James Bond aficionados. It's the MI6 building, which is seen in a number of the films, uh, now known as the SIS building. It's been here since 1994. It's got 80s-style architecture. It does resemble a modernist Mayan temple, and it has a very Art Deco feel to it. We are on Vauxhall Bridge, and we're going to talk about the life of Ian Fleming. So normally what I try to do on these world ofs is take one person, it's usually a writer, and discuss their life and their influences and their most famous works and I always conduct the tours in a part of London where they lived or at least had some connection with some of the other tours I do people like Agatha Christie, Arthur Conan Doyle they've all created characters quite heavily linked to their lives maybe even more so with the great Ian Fleming so, what I've managed to work out, there are at least 11 properties in London associated with Ian Fleming. There's only one with a blue plaque. It's quite an imposing building which we'll see near the end of the tour, but Fleming only lived in the small apartment in it. This area of London, between here and Vauxhall, and Battersea further to the west, behind where we're looking at the moment, was his stomping ground. And the people, the sights, the smells, the experiences in this area would have shaped his greatest, most famous creation, that of James Bond. Some people might call him Ian Fleming's alter ego, because so much of Fleming's own experiences filtered into the James Bond's novels. So scholars have worked out, we think, all of Fleming's London addresses. He certainly flitted around a fair deal. Eleven have been identified for such a short life. Only, sadly, a very brief 56 years. It, it, it really is a lot of moving about. And it's the first link between James Bond and Ian Fleming, the lifestyle, never really settling, never feeling at home anywhere, always on the move. So we'll get to Bond in a moment. We'll talk about the life of Ian Fleming for a while. He was a Londoner. He was born further in the direction we're looking now, in Mayfair, 1908, to Evelyn and Valentine Fleming. Evelyn was a wealthy Swiss socialite. Valentine was a politician and he had Scottish and Swiss roots. And some of his extended family were celebrities. His cousin was Christopher Lee and his sister-in-law was a very famous actress, Celia Johnson, who a lot of you might know from Brief Encounter. The attachment to London stayed with him throughout his life. It was broken up now and then by school days at Eton, childhood days at the family home, which was Joyce Grove in Oxfordshire. It's 
time with the Forbes Dennises at Kitzbühel in Germany and a period at the University of Geneva. And he also had country homes in Kent and then Wiltshire. And at the end of his life, for quite a long time, he spent a few months each year after the Second World War in Jamaica on his estate where he would write eventually all of the Bond stories and he called the estate Golden Eye. 1939, on the eve of World War II, Rear Admiral John Godfrey, who was a director of naval intelligence in the Royal Navy, he recruited Fleming, who was then a reserve in the Black Watch, as it was known, as his personal assistant. He was commissioned first as a Royal Naval Volunteer, reserve lieutenant, or lieutenant, Subsequently, he was promoted to Lieutenant Commander, then Commander in itself. The others in the office with him, well, he hardly ever got to know them by name. Because of the secrecy, they were given code names, an idea which Fleming would then use years later in the books. Fleming's code name was 17F. Maybe doesn't read so well as 007. 1940, Fleming and Godfrey decided to contact a man named Kenneth Mason, who was a professor of geography at Oxford University. And it was to do with preparing reports devoted to the geography of countries engaged in military operations. These reports were the start, in a way, of the Naval Intelligence Division geographical handbook series, as it was known, produced between 1941 and 1946. He was office-based, but he was preparing work for the officers in the field of action. So, in a way, he was like a desk-based spy. He came up with quite a few clever ideas. Maps rolled up and hidden in razors the usual spy-type techniques. But one of the more extreme ideas he had was to drop a dead body of an Englishman in German territory. Now, he says, stated, had to be a fresh corpse. But on that body were the details of made-up, fake, Allied forces raids. The idea being the hope that the enemy would then find, happen upon this person and the reports and divert their troops to certain areas where nothing was actually happening. He also created a plan for a while which didn't come to fruition to use a man named Alistair Crowley, a British occultist, to try to trick Rudolf Hess into attempting to contact a fake cell of Englishmen who were anti churchillites The plan wasn't used. Actually, it wasn't used because it wasn't needed. By the point it was almost ready, Rudolf Hess himself had flown to Scotland in an apparent attempt to broker peace behind Hitler's back. It's also suggested that Fleming's work lured Hess into flying to Scotland in May 1941. On well, a very fascinating link, Fleming also formulated a plan named Operation Goldeneye, which was a plan to maintain communication with Gibraltar, as well as a plan of defence in an unlikely event that Spain joined the Axis powers and together with Germany would invade the Mediterranean colony. So he's working on some interesting projects. In 1942, he formed an auxiliary unit known as 30 AU, or the 30 Assault Unit, and he nicknamed them his own Red Indians. They were specifically trained in lockpicking, safe cracking, certain forms of unarmed combat, and other techniques and skills for collecting intelligence, real Bond-esque. He meticulously planned all of the raids, 
alongside a man named Patrick Dalzell Job, who was one of the inspirations for James Bond. He went so far as to memorize aerial photographs so that the missions could be planned in detail. And because of their successes in Sicily and Italy, this company, 30AU, was greatly enlarged and Fleming's direct control was increased before D-Day. Fleming also even visited 30AU in the field. He wasn't just being still desk-based. He visited them during and after Operation Overlord. And after the Cherbourg attack, he felt that the unit had been incorrectly used as a frontline force. He wanted them to be more an intelligence gathering unit and the tactics were eventually revised. Okay, so there's a lot to get through. We'll jump forward a bit. Fleming said at the end of the war, all he wanted to do with his life, the rest of his life, was to write spy novels. It's interesting, the parallels with Agatha Christie. Their fathers died young. Agatha was dared to write a detective story and Fleming was more or less dared to write a spy story. And both, with the work that they had been doing for the war effort, both put all of that into their work. Agatha Christie worked as an apothecary, a chemist, and her books are filled with poisons and potions. Fleming came from a wealthy, well-connected family and worked in espionage and government. And you've got James Bond with his love of expensive clothing, expensive fine food, the best wine, the love of travel, romance, as well as the covert, secret way he was working. Bond was too. It seemed like Bond was Fleming, in a way. Fleming actually years later said in an interview that James Bond was 90% him, but the dangerous stuff was a creation. So Commander James Bond was created in 1952, residing off the King's Road in Chelsea, about 20 minutes walk from where we are now, working all over the world. He was invented as a Cold War operative, trained in intelligence, special forces, always using the latest gadgets, bringing international gangsters to justice and always having encounters with mysterious women. An obsessive gambler, a huge drinker and an extreme smoker. In one of the novels, On Her Majesty's Secret Service, he is counted Bond as having 47 alcoholic drinks. He was also mentioned as having a 60 cigarette a day smoking habit, which in one of the novels, after a visit to a health farm, he cuts down to a nice manageable 25 a day. But again, all in all, very close to Fleming's own lifestyle. The first book, Casino Royale. On film, Bond is often charismatic and stylish, very solitary, more or less friendless, but mysterious and addicted to be around. In the books, he's slightly different. A lot of the characteristics that Fleming created were based on a number of people he knew when he worked in the Naval Intelligence Division. The name came from, Fleming said years later, an author of a book, Birds of the West Indies. Fleming said he wanted a brief, unromantic, masculine, Anglo-Saxon name, and James Bond fitted the bill. He said it was the most boring name he could come up with. He also said he wanted Bond himself, not just the name, but the person to be a dull, blunt instrument. Not something really you could say about the present charismatic James Bond, but originally he was created not as someone who made things happen, but someone 
who things happen to. I suppose some of the greatest stories in fiction, in books and films, are about ordinary people caught up in extraordinary circumstances. Certainly the best action films are in that ice style. Fleming said he originally imagined his look to be that of the singer, songwriter, actor, musician, Hoagie Carmichael. But when the first major film adaptation, Dr. No, was released in 1962, Fleming said from then on, the only face he could see when he was writing was Sean Connors. That's happened to a few writers, where if the work is adapted to TV and film, the characters take on the personalities of the actors. Fleming, near the end of his series of novels, it feels, was actually writing more for James Bond and Sean Connery rather than just Bond alone. Two major additions that Connery promoted were the humour, which is more absent in the books, and especially something that arrived a little while later, the Scottish ancestry that Connery brought to the role. Casino Royale was the first novel, written in 1952 in Jamaica, released in 1953. In the next 14 years, Fleming wrote 12 novels and two books of Bond short stories. Two of the books were released after Fleming's death. In 1954, we had the first screen adaptation of a Bond story. It was released on CBS in the United States as part of the Climax TV anthology series. But Bond was altered to be an American. Barry Nelson played Jimmy Bond. Barry Nelson, by the way, also played Mr. Ullman, the owner of the Overlook Hotel in The Shining, who gives Jack Torrance the job as caretaker. The first British actor to play Bond was a man named Bob Holness in 1955 in a radio adaptation of Moonlight. Woody Allen made a spoof Casino Royale in 1967 with a few different actors playing Bond. Peter Sellers, David Niven and, strangely, Woody Allen himself. It'd be hard to find two more different actors to play Bond than Woody Allen and Sean Connery. But Connery is who, who I think we can all agree is the first James Bond to start the ball rolling. He first appeared in Doctor No in 1962, the sixth novel to be released, but the first film to be made. So already, right at the offset of the films, the books and films, the order has been mixed up. One of the main reasons for that is because Thunderball was originally going to be the first film, but Fleming had co-created the story with another producer so there were lawsuits and litigations which actually continued all the way to the 2000s. Who owned the rights? It's a complicated story in itself. The main production company were E.O.N. E-O-N Productions, headed by two men, Albert R., or as we know him, Cubby Broccoli, and another man, Harry Saltzman. The company has produced 25 films in the Bond series, more films than stories. Over the years, other writers have been brought in to create new adventures. The one film in the middle of it all, which was a slight enigma, was Never Say Never Again in 1983. It was an adaptation of the novel Thunderball, which at the time, Eon Films never had the rights to. The reason for the name is simple. Sean Connery had given up the role. Roger Moore was playing it. Connery said he would never play the character again, and his wife said to him, never say never again, and it stuck. We all have our favourite bonds. Ones we grew up with, 
ones we revisited as grown-ups. I would never dare judge any of the actors and their versions of Bond. They have all brought something to the role. Bond in the film series has been played by Sean Connery, George Lazenby, Roger Moore, Timothy Dalton, Pierce Brosnan and Daniel Craig. Roger Moore the most, with seven. George Lazenby, only once. George Lazenby got too overconfident after On Her Majesty's Secret Service. He bought a boat. He went sailing round the world. And when he returned, the producers let him go. He was considered unpredictable, a bit over exuberant in rehearsals and to be honest even though the film is enjoyable he wasn't the greatest actor to play Bond he played Bond light-hearted so the producers they wanted someone with a bit more gravitas so they ended up getting Roger Moore in I discovered that Timothy Dalton before Roger Moore had been offered the role he was 21 years old and he turned it down because he said he was too young so Lazenby was considered too light-hearted and they got Roger Moore in, who was also light-hearted and goofy. But in the early films, he was more serious. And then Bond went into a slightly different direction. It seems to reinvent itself year after year. It ended up with probably the silliest film of all of them. Moonraker, a lot of it set in space. The producers then went back, after Moore's seven film stint, to Timothy Dalton, who played him twice, and to a lot of Bond experts was probably, until Daniel Craig, the closest Bond to the novels, a bit dull, a blunt instrument, prone to maybe more violence than the previous Bonds. A six-year gap, and then Pierce Brosnan in the 90s, gadget-heavy, smooth, suave. Another who had actually been offered the role before. He had been asked before Timothy Dalton, but he was tied up with the TV show Remington Steel. And then the franchise had another break for four years. More lawsuits. Who owned what names? Who got the biggest shares? So there was this gap. And then the most recent Bond, Daniel Craig, took over. Paul Greengrass had directed The Bourne Identity. So the idea of Bond is a close combat, slightly more rugged, more nomadic character, with not much humour developed. And after the most recent film, No Time To Die, we wait for the announcement of the next Bond. Will the next Bond use the same catchphrase, shaken not stirred, the name's Bond, James Bond? Will there be product placement? Probably. Who the villain will be will be a big question. Who will play the villain and will it be somebody who was a villain in an old Bond movie or novel, Dr. No? Odd job, will there be a reinvention of Jaws? Who will be the Bond girl? The Bond girl names I always find fascinating. The innuendos, Plenty O'Toole, Holly Goodhead, Pussy Galore, Chew Me, Honey Rider. There were always at least two, one who helps, one who's a villain, and sometimes the one who helps turns out to be a villain. Then the helpers themselves. Miss Moneypenny. Q, who's been played by a great many actors. The inventor of many gadgets. The inventor of the phrase, Oh, do grow up, 007. M. Judy Dench has played M recently. Ray Fiennes, too. A parent figure, always worried, always scolding always trying to look after their erratic son. Fleming himself wrote three hours in the morning, 
one in the afternoon, never looked back at what he wrote. After the three months of writing, he would spend the rest of the year revising, promoting, interviewing, and living life. He passed away in Canterbury in Kent on the 12th of August, 1964, after only a 12-year period of Bond writing. The character of James Bond had been made an orphan at 11. Fleming's father passed away when Ian was eight. His mother lived throughout his life. His mother, who guided her erratic son, Ian, who financially bailed him out on a number of occasions in his early adulthood. His caring and firm mother, who he said he affectionately referred to as Ed. Two last things. The Bond themes always interested in who will be singing the Bond theme. My personal favourite is Duran Duran's View to a Kill and also License to Kill. The cars, the Aston Martin, the iconic car. One of the great bits of research that I looked into was in 1961 in the United States. JFK, John F. Kennedy, named From Russia With Love as one of his favourite books of the year. And if it wasn't for that, Bond may have not taken off in the US and the films may never have been commissioned. And it helped it worldwide. So thanks for joining me here around the Vauxhall area. We've now crossed over on to the north bank of the river and we're just approaching the plaque of one of the 11 properties that Ian Fleming lived in. As I said, this is all live, these tours. This one, there's a few signal drops whenever we do it live, live. So I created the tour, did the commentary live, and now I've uploaded it to YouTube. So there will be a few gaps here and there, a few dissolves, but I hope that you enjoyed what we did. And do join me again here on Intermission Tours. Do subscribe to the channel and do like, comment and share. And we'll talk about another wonderful figure very, very soon. Lots of love. Bye-bye.